Um, Ephesians chapter 6, I think, is probably as important or more important in today's world than it ever has been. Um, and the thought going into what I'm going to speak about this morning and into this afternoon, because it's many, many, many topics. I had this idea for maybe uh, putting a book together called The Supernatural Bible. Um, you've heard me talk about uh, being uh, like in going to Kenya or even here where I had devils literally attacking me. And I mean literally. Uh, if you remember uh, a few weeks ago, I told you of a dream that I had and I absolutely firmly believe that a devil spirit was in that dream um, terrorizing me. And it was so, it was so real, um, I asked my wife later, on, it was like a Friday night, Saturday morning, I asked my wife, I said, did you hear me talking? in my sleep and she said yeah I said what was I saying and she said who are you and I was fairly certain that I was speaking that not only well I know I was speaking it in my dream but the reason why I asked my wife was I was pretty sure she had to have heard me saying it out loud because I was saying who are you what are you doing and get off me okay and it was to me it was as real as anything It's as real as this is right now and in that dream um, I remember bringing trying to bring out the name of Jesus and it was like I had a mouthful of marshmallows it was like my tongue was swollen but I said in Jesus name leave me alone and after that the spirit left and I'm debating I am debating I've told my wife but I'm debating about telling you what kind of spirit I think it was I'm not sure if I will or not okay so if God wants me to say it I'll say it if not I won't um, but like I said it was as real as as this is right now we live in a world that is surrounded by spirits there is a warfare going on around us at all times every day 24 7 there is a warfare going on God I believe in God's angels ministering and watching over us. I believe that. In fact, hold your place in Ephesians and go to Psalm 91. <clears throat> Psalm 91, <clears throat> verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Remember what I told you earlier about not being afraid that you might accidentally take the mark of the beast? God will not let you do it. But there is a place you must be. You must abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You must be in the sheepfold. Are you hearing me? You must be in the sheepfold, meaning you must be a sheep. Jesus knows whether or not you're a wolf in sheep's clothing. In fact, I've got that in my notes here about wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay? I'm telling you, God, if you are in the sheepfold of Jesus Christ, the wolf will come, but Jesus will not let him in. David is a type of Christ, and when a lion stole a lamb out of his father's flock, what did David do? 
chased the lion down, grabbed him by the beard, punched him in the face to make the lion let go of that lamb. That ain't me. I'm not that brave. Okay? I've watched, me and Sterling sat in my office and watched lion videos and uh-uh. I'm not doing it. But Christ is. He's, David wasn't afraid and neither is Jesus Christ. But you have to be in the sheepfold. You have to abide under the shadow of his wings. Verse 2, I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely. What does the word surely mean? Absolutely, certainly, without a doubt. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will protect you. He shall cover thee with his feathers. And under his wings shalt thou trust. And his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. And what did we say his truth was? The word of God is thy shield. Remember, we have a shield of what? Faith. Faith is the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then he says, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Now, I've been dealing and battling fear, depression, anxiety for several years now. I never used to be that way. But it's just, it's just something that's happened to me. I don't know why. I, I, I'll bear it. If it's a thorn of God, I will bear it. And I will accept God's grace and endure it. But I don't like it. But I'm telling you, I am telling you that on the worst day ever of your life, Christ will be there and you will not be afraid. You will not be. Um, verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall what? He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. How many of you would raise your hand because you know for a fact that at a certain time, an angel or angels protected you from dying. Raise your hand. Look at there. All over this building. So you believe in them, don't you? If there are good angels there, they're there for a reason. It's because there are bad ones there. And the good ones are helping to protect and keep you from the effects of those bad ones. Now, that does not mean that God will not test you. That's a different subject. Because I believe God tests our faith. Our faith, that's what First Peter is all about, that the trial of your faith. It's all about your faith being tried. So I believe that those God will let those devils, those spirits, interact with us, like in my dream, or... At times when, I mean, I had devils all over me telling me to leave, telling me to leave my wife, telling me to quit the church, telling me to, to move out of here, to get out, telling me to leave Kenya on two different occasions, both two trips to Kenya. I had to endure that. For weeks I endured that. And I know it's real. And God was, God was strengthening me. He was teaching my hands how to, how to know warfare. He was teaching my fingers to fight, David said in the book of Psalms. And how do we fight those things? We pray. And we pull the Bible out and we read scriptures like Psalm 91. Who, who was just now blessed by reading this Psalm? Say, say amen. amen. See how it works? Just pull this old Bible out on him. He might hang around for a while, but he can't stand it very long. Even Satan himself, being in the presence of Jesus Christ, eventually he left him for a season because he could not bear to be in the presence of the Holy One of God. And think of these devils as beasts because that's what they are. They are like, and I'm using the word beast, that's a Bible term, animals. You think of it that way. 
They have a nature and a, and a way about them that they cannot escape. And let me, let me take a moment to explain that to you for a minute. We got three of the stupidest dogs in my house I've ever seen in my life. I can't stand them. And one of them is a male. And he is after those two females every 38 seconds. I, it makes me so mad. Now, why does he do that? It's in his nature. It is he, dogs do not choose mates like we do. They don't fall in love. They choose mates based upon seasons, scent, and instinct. And you can't stop them from it. There's just no way. There's no way to train it out of them. It's there and it's going to stay there. And if you think your pet poodle loves you and would never hurt you, if you died in your house and no one came to your house to find you, your dog will eat you. That happened up in St. Louis. This guy was raising pit bulls. And he had a pit bull in his house, and his pit bull turned on him and killed him. They didn't find him for several days. He ended up missing. They finally went to his house. There the body was with the pit bull. So that's how, that's how devils are. They have a beast nature that they cannot escape. They cannot choose what we choose. They do not have free will. They do what God made them to do. Do you understand that? Okay. So when we read Ephesians 6, <clears throat> um, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Is that, is that verse still valid? Is that still real? Uh, Sister Betty came to me and she told me that she has friends that, that question her all the time about the Bible and they say that, that Bible was written for people thousands of years ago, but it doesn't have anything to do with us now. Boy, those people are so wrong and so ignorant. And I'm not saying ignorant in a bad way. They are ignorant. They don't know that this Bible is more right now than it ever has been. They don't read their Bible. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The battle is not against who's in the White House. And it never was. It's about who's in your house. You get that? That was good. I'll write that down. Use that. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. These are all devils now. Principalities, princes. It means they have authority and powers. It means that they have power to cause people to do things non-believers or they try to use that power against you to influence you in some way or to cause you to sin against the rulers of the darkness of this world now I want you to think about this in real terms are there animals that only come out at night sure there are and what they are they are examples to us of spirits that are in the spiritual realm God wrote this book as like a Boy Scouts guide to devils to show us what they're like and what they'll do and what they can and cannot do rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness spiritual there he names the spirit their spirits spiritual wickedness in high places and my my whole point is this all of us or most of us have lived in America all of our lives and we think in American ways we think that we don't pay attention to devils and spirits and ghosts and creatures of darkness like that we don't think of them that way because America is a I guess we think of ourselves as a higher thinking people 
And the public school system has taught us that there is no spirits and there's no God. There's only evolution and there's only what we can see in microscopes and telescopes and see in the world around us. So we have sort of just developed this idea that spirits and all these things that we see in the Bible were for people two or three thousand years ago, but they don't exist now. And I'm telling you, they do. They exist now and you can see the evidence of it. And so I... I just started thinking of supernatural things that are beyond normal that are in your Bible. Okay? First thing I come up with was giants because I was just trying to go through in order in the Bible. There were giants. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6. Again, this Bible's not wrong. And I love to go around to churches and tell people I'm, I'm a guy that believes in giants, dragons, and unicorns. I do. I believe in all three of those things because they're all mentioned in the Bible. They are both in the physical realm and the spiritual realm. So Genesis chapter 6 is the chapter right before the flood. And we get then an idea of why God flooded the earth. Because the world apparently was overrun with corruption. The Bible says in Genesis 6 that all flesh had corrupted itself. E everything was corrupt. All the, all the flesh, all the animals, all the people, they were corrupt. And we have an event that took place before the flood and it happened after the flood. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. So this is after Adam... But I, uh, I think it's possible that Adam was still alive because he lived 930 years. He lived almost as, uh, who was the oldest guy in the Bible? Methuselah, 969 years. And apparently Methuselah died the same year the flood occurred. I don't know if Methuselah died in the flood, but if you do the math, Methuselah died the same year that it, flo that it, it flooded the earth. So it's highly possible that Adam was alive when these giants started showing up and Adam saw them. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, human daughters, that the sons of God. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the who the sons of God are. I've done several videos on this, but the sons of God are angels. They were evil, bad angels. Okay. The sons of God, uh, let me give you a verse. Let me give you one verse. Psalm 82. Turn there. I give you one verse. And I was going to put this in my notes. I forgot about it. I have sat for hours just tweaking these presentations and adding things and taking things away. And <clears throat> a lot of work goes into this. Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. That verse right there tells you a, the sons of God are gods, little g. Psalm 82, 6, write that, underline that in your Bible, write it down, make a note. The sons of God, the children of the Most High, are gods, with a little g. Meaning, they are spirits, either good angels or devils. One of the two. So, the sons of God, angels. And ask yourself the question, have you ever seen, who's, ever, who's seen the movie um, City of Angels with, you know that movie? Meg, Meg Ryan and Nick, Nick Cage, right? And who is Nicolas Cage in this movie? An angel. And who's Meg Ryan in this movie? A human woman. And what does... Nicholas Cage wanted to do, well, don't say it. What he, what he wants to do with Meg Ryan. He, want, he wants to be with her. So he falls. A guy named John Messenger, and the word angel means messenger, tell, tells him, I used to be one of you guys. I used to be one of you angels. He's sitting in the library all day long, and he's smoking and eating bacon, and he's just, you know, he's just enjoying humanity. And he tells Nicholas Cage how to do it. You fall. So he, Nicholas Cage gets up. He's an angel and he literally falls down to the ground. And now he's a human. 
and he mates with who's ever seen Superman the movie the the 70s version Superman 2 what did Clark Kent what does Superman want to do he want to be with Lois Lane he had to he had to fall from his godhood lose his power so he could be with Lois Lane these movies are right out of the Bible they're telling you what happened this Bible's right. So the sons of God, these spirits, these angels, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. So God started a clock of 120 years. Tick tock, tick tock. I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy it all. So then in verse 4 says there were giants in the earth in those days. Giants. And we're going to read a verse of scripture that gives us an indication of how possibly how tall some of these giants were. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, meaning after the flood, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. You understand that language. I don't have to describe it, right? The sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. That means that they mated with them. And now these giants are a hybrid species between heavenly creatures and earthly humans. And they bear children to them. The same became mighty men which are of old, men of renown. Now what that means is that if you look at every civilization's history, every civilization, Greek, Roman, Native American, Aztec, Mayan, Ancient Chinese, ancient Japanese, or ancient Russian, ancient European stories, they all believed in giants. Every one of them believed in giants. And saw them and interacted with them and in many cases had to kill them because of how mean they were. You have stories everywhere that literally were men of renown. And so the Bible's telling you, search out history. Every culture, every civilization has giant stories. So here's what I think was going on. Turn back to Genesis 3. I think the devil initiated a plan. Because of something God said. In Genesis 3, this is after Adam and Eve has fallen and Satan now, and the serpent, has deceived Adam and Eve and God's going to judge all three of them. And he says to the serpent, The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. There is no creature lower than the serpent. Because even an ant has legs. Even an ant is raised up above the ground about that much. But serpents are low, the lowest form possible. God made them that way. But are we talking about just earthly serpents? No. Spirits. Because... Turn to Revelation 12. Verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So the serpent here was a spirit. Remember, I said they're beasts. And the devil is a beast. He is a dragon, a serpent. Okay? So God said back in Genesis 3, I will put enmity, which is hatred, warfare. We don't get along and are never going to get along. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed. Now stop and think about what he's saying here. Who's the seed of the woman? Jesus. Was he real? Was he flesh? Yeah. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
but also it mentions thy seed. Whose seed? The serpent. And what is seed? This is DNA. Does the devil have DNA? You just read it right here. And between thy seed and her seed. And the, we know what the Bible means by this. It means offspring. But how do you get an offspring? DNA. So this is stuff that you won't hear Joel Osteen preach on. But it's important because I think the thing that has already happened is the thing that will happen. I think Ecclesiastes 1 is right. I think that time is circular and what we see that has happened in the Old Testament, New Testament is going to happen in the last days. And the Bible is our guide to that. The Bible tells us what happened so we can know what will happen. And I think that the devil, knowing that the seed of the woman was going to destroy the seed of the serpent, he tries then to corrupt the seed of mankind. He tried to destroy the Jews, did he not? He's always tried to destroy the Jews throughout the whole New, the Old Testament. He was trying to destroy them because of what would be produced by the Jews, Jesus Christ. If he can stop Jesus from being born, he wins. Remember in Revelation 12, he's standing before the woman who's about ready to give birth to the man child who's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. What's he going to do when that baby's born? He's going to eat it so that it cannot rule and then he wins. In his mind, he wins. Okay? So that's why I think that these angels came and started mingling their seed with humanity's seed. What do we know from Daniel chapter 2 is going to happen? They are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. And what is seed? It's DNA. It's always been that. Now we understand it. We understand it now better than all of our forefathers, because they didn't know what DNA was. They didn't know the mechanics of how children were produced in the womb. That 23 chromosomes from the woman and 23 chromosomes from the man joined together, and there you have a child who looks like the mom and the dad both at the same time. How amazing is that? Okay, so the devil is always trying to destroy God's seed, His Word, and Jesus Christ, and so on and so forth. That's why I think it happened. Now, turn to Numbers 13. We get an idea from Numbers 13 of how big, mean, rotten, Fearful, these giants were. Numbers chapter 13, because they finally, after a year, they left Egypt, and after about a year, they get to the promised land. They get right to the edge of, the, of Canaan land. And they could have gone in right then. They were there. They were there. They could have marched right in. Moses, God told Moses, take 12 men, one from each tribe, and we're going to send them in for 40 days to spy out the land. And when they come back, they're going to tell what they saw there. Now, God knew what would happen, didn't he? God knows everything. God knew that 10 of those guys were going to come back and say, we cannot go into that land. Those giants are so big that we look like grasshoppers to them. Now, if you believe your Bible, that's a ratio of human size versus giant size. Is it possible that those giants, some of those giants were in excess of 20 feet tall, 30 feet tall? 35 feet tall. If you do some research on giants, you will find stories 
of the discovery of skeletal remains of giants that by the measurements of like the femur bone, the giant would have been in an excess of 35 feet tall. And, it, and it, I'll show you evidence of it in a minute. In Numbers 13, 27. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Remember, they were carrying back a cluster, one cluster of grapes on a big stick. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and, and very great. Now, remember that, that the Bible said that. The cities are walled and very great. Because I'm going to show you something in a minute. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Anak was one of the giants after the flood. And, and he was huge compared to us. They saw his children there. So in verse 30... Caleb still the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. And there we saw the giant. Look at verse 33. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Is it possible that some of those giants were so tall that Joshua, Caleb, and the other ten men literally, literally were the size of grasshoppers to us? Is it possible? I believe so. I believe so. See that stone there on the top left? That is the largest quarried stone in the world. See those people walking on it? You see how big that is? That is a left, in fact, the, the stone was unfinished. The bottom of it is not, from what I can remember, is not complete. How would you move a stone like that? They say it is in excess of 120 tons. We don't have a method right now of quarrying and moving a stone that big. But it was meant to be a foundation stone because just about a mile and a half from where this is laying is the remnants of the wall. This is at Baalbek, Lebanon. And, and you can see that the bottom part of the wall has stones in it this big. And then the giants ceased the Romans came in and built a, the rest of the wall on top of it, but their stones were only this big. You can clearly see a difference between what the Roman soldiers or whoever the Roman slaves put on the wall and that giant 120 ton stone that they had on the foundation. My question is, even if you could build with something like that, why would you? Why would they? There's no reason. Who can move stones this big? Giants. I believe Stonehenge was built by giants. And that's the legend that exists in, in England, was that it was built by giants. These are megaliths. These are stones that weigh 40, 50 tons and laid with precision. On the lower left-hand side is the remnant of a wall found in Russia, in the middle of the woods. And again, that stone there is like the one at Baalbek. It is huge. And it was quarried and put in place there. Not by slaves, because slaves wouldn't be able to... There's no way that humans could have quarried these stones and moved them. Why would they? And then here, 
This is in Peru. I, I can't pronounce the name. I can't remember the name, but it's in Peru. And it was a wall built by these megalithic stones, these huge, sometimes 20, 30, 40 ton stones put in place. And I want you to notice how they're cut. They're cut in such a way as the stone that's laid on top was carved to fit the stones underneath it with such precision that you cannot even slip a piece of paper into the joints between those stones. We don't, we kind of have technology now to do that with stone cutting methods, with machine stone cutting methods that we have now. We sort of have that technology, but they say that this was built by Stone Age people using copper and brass tools. No way. Not a chance. Here you have all over the world the remnant of the giants. This Bible's right. Uh, here is a city called Gobekli Tepe. And let me tell you about this place. Nobody knew it existed until like 20 years ago. The man who owned this land, it was like this big hill, and he noticed a, a strange stone sticking up out of the ground. He was using it as pasture for his sheep. And he kind of dug around it and he saw that it looked like a, a quarried stone was there. So he makes a phone call, some archaeologists come out. Then they turn this whole place into a, an archaeological dig and they start digging out where this temple was. The, the picture that I have on the bottom is a nighttime picture of what they've dug out so far. They're saying that this city existed 12,000 years ago. I don't believe that. I do believe it existed before the flood. But here's the interesting thing that they can't figure out. Number one, they can't figure out how it was built. Number two, they know for a fact that once it was built and in all these stones in place, it looks like a temple and probably was some sort of worship temple that somebody came along and filled the whole place with dirt and covered it up for whatever reason. Nobody knows because it wasn't buried like in, I don't know how to, how to describe it. Somebody came and brought in massive amounts of dirt and covered this entire temple complex up so that nobody would ever find it, but they found it. And they're still digging. They're, they're finding stuff all the time out there. How did this happen? We even have cities underground, or underwater, excuse me. Underwater. What does that tell you? They were built when? Before the flood. Um, this area here is off the coast of Japan. And those stones were the remnants of some temple or some building that was built out of quarried stones that were absolutely enormous in size. This was discovered, I don't know how many years ago, off the west coast of Cuba. It's so far down, we can't really send divers down there, but this is a radar image, a sonar image, or some kind of computer generated image of an undersea pyramid complex. I think it's, I don't know how far it is under, under the water, but it's too far for divers to get down there. But there's a city down here at the bottom of the ocean. How did it get there? The flood. Who built it? The giants. Because remember what your Bible said back in Numbers. They said that when they went into Canaan land, the walls were huge. It was walled up and it was great. And when they saw the size, both of the men and the walls, they said, there's no way we can even approach that. 40 years later, the first city that they attacked was Jericho. And what happened to the walls? 
God busted them all down. Amen? That would have happened 40 years earlier had they just believed what God said. But those people had to die in the wilderness in a new generation. You believe in giants? And, they, and there is, if you do, there is not another explanation for how the giants came to be. And again, I've explained this before. We're not just talking about tall people. Um, who knows that from the Guinness Book of World Records, the tallest known man in the Guinness Book. Yes, David. All, the Alton Giant. How tall was he? Eight foot, 11 and three quarter. And he was still growing. He died at like 23 years old. He, he got an infection from a, for, a poorly fitted brace and he died at 23. He was still growing. He had a tumor on his pituitary gland that was causing him to grow. And, but see, he had problems. He was his size created problems for how he walked, how he did things. He wasn't a basketball player because he couldn't run. So we're not talking about just tall people. We're talking about massive men of great stature that were on this earth at this time. And I believe, let's go to, let's go to Daniel 2. I believe that a similar event is going to take place. I believe Daniel 2 is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of the four kingdoms. The first kingdom, the kingdom of gold, the head, was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. The second kingdom, the kingdom of silver, was the uh, Medo-Persian empire that took over after Nebuchadnezzar. The third kingdom was the Greco-Roman empire. First the Grecians, then the Romans took over. They were a world empire, not really the whole world, but a lot of it. The fourth kingdom was different. Because while you have pure gold, pure silver, pure brass, by the time you get to the fourth kingdom on the feet, they're different. Look, let's look how they're different. Verse 40, uh, verse 40. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. But look at the toes. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. The toes are part iron and part clay. Now how can you stick iron and clay together? Sterling, can you do it? Can you weld clay? You're a welder. Can you weld clay to iron? There's no way. So that kingdom is divided against itself. And that's what Jesus meant when he said that. Any kingdom divided against itself shall not stand. And this kingdom, because the feet of it are iron and clay, it's going to fall. So he says... Verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Notice that they're opposite each other. Verse 43, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So that fourth kingdom, I, we just read that verse, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Those four, those spirits around us, God's going to kick out a third of the angels from heaven. Up out of the ground is going to come an, an entire army of evil spirits that are shaped like locusts. They have the faces of men and the hair of women, like some of the people you see at Walmart. Amen. But they're coming. And the Bible says they're going to mingle themselves with man's DNA and alter mankind forever. 
And when that happens, God's going to throw them all in the lake of fire. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. This event is going to take place again. Promise you. Who's ever heard of an incubus? What is it? Okay, that's one, Will. An incubus. An incubus is a spirit that comes down to rape women or show up in their dreams somehow. A succubus is a similar spirit. It's a female spirit that molests men or attempts to arouse men to mate with them and your Bible tells you that that's possible that's what we just learned the sons of God and the daughters of men the Bible's telling you yes what was it that the two angels when they went to Sodom what did they encounter when they got to Sodom the men of Sodom wanted to do what with those angels you know that you know what they wanted to do so is it possible the men of Sodom thought so God destroyed them because of it in ancient Mesopotamia there is a succubus called Lilith that word in the Hebrew Bibles was often translated as owl and here we have an ancient goddess who has owls feet she has owls present next to her she was worshipped as a goddess of fertility in ancient Mesopotamia real stuff here do spirits still exist they didn't just all die off 3,000 years ago they didn't all die off 2,000 years ago at Calvary they're still around people they're still around okay and whether or not you think it's happening now, I believe it will happen when these angels are kicked out of heaven. When, they're, when they have been thrown out of their first estate, I believe they will mate and mingle with human seed, men's DNA. Job 4.18, Job said, Behold, he put no trust in his servants and his angels he charged with folly. God charged angels with a crime, the crime of folly. Folly is not always, but often uh, defined in Scripture in 2 Samuel 13.12. This is David's daughter. She answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. Uh, it was Amnon, her brother, that was trying to rape her and succeeded and she called it folly God charged these group of angels with the crime of folly and I believe he put them in prison in the lower parts of the earth and they're being held there and he's going to release them in Revelation 9 is what I think is going to happen Satan's seed. Remember what I said earlier? Does Satan have DNA? Can he produce children? Look at your Bible. Deuteronomy 13, 13. The children of Belial. Who's Belial? It's the devil. 1 Samuel 25, 17. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. God's even describing to you what these children of Belial are like. They don't serve God. They won't worship God. In Deuteronomy 13, the children of Belial caused people to go and say, let's go and serve other gods. And that happened. Um, 2 Samuel 23, 6, the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away. Thorns always a type of sin and corruption in the Bible. 
1 Kings 21.10, they set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him. Now, some scholars say, well, that's just like a form of a curse word. It's like calling somebody a, uh, you know what? I think the Bible is telling you that one of these days, and, and I think it's possible that there could be people on this earth right now alive who are literally children of Belial. I believe it's possible. Okay? Second Chronicles 13, they're gathered unto him vain men, children of Belial, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. There was a rebellion that took place by the children of Belial. Matthew, oh, Matthew 23, 15. Look at this. Woe on you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell. Did you know hell in the Bible is always figured as a woman? So is the earth. We are not children of hell. We're children of what? Jerusalem above which is free, which is the mother of us all, is what Paul said in Galatians chapter 4. So you see the opposite? When you were born the first time, you were born a child of your earthly father and mother. When you're born again, you are the son of God, a child of God, and heaven above is your mother, Paul said. The Bible says that. But then we have the opposite here. That when these scribes and Pharisees go out with their false doctrine, they make someone twofold a child of hell. That means they're born again to damnation. Meaning they can never be saved after that. And I believe the Bible is telling us that to show us what happens when someone takes the mark of the beast. They become a twofold. The Bible says that they're twice dead. When you were lost, Gary, the, Paul said you were already dead in your trespasses and sins. But God saved you. You're born again. You, are you dead anymore? You're alive, and when you die, you're going to be alive for how long? Forever. These people who become a twofold child of hell already are dead in their flesh but something happens and they are corrupted and now they are like night of the living dead zombies okay they are twofold the child of hell meaning there is no way in the world there ever can be saved God has turned them over to a reprobate mind they are apostate and they're going to hell, period. Um, Matthew, tw oh, Matthew 23, 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of who? Vipers. You have to ask yourself the question, is it possible that the men that Jesus was talking to were literally part of that offspring the remnant of the giants maybe I don't know but he called them a generation of vipers their father year he said you're of your father who who did he say their father was the devil did he mean that I told you it's going to get weird what time is it I should, have, I should have gave you a break 20 minutes ago. Acts 13.10, Paul dealt with a false prophet, and he said, Thou child of the devil. Is it possible that this false prophet was already a generation of, a literal child of Satan himself did he possess Satan's DNA in him causing him to he was a sorcerer by the way he had powers 
He could do things. And his job, Paul went to this man, Sergius Paulus, who was a deputy of that area, to preach the gospel because he wanted to hear the word of God. And as Paul's preaching to him, this false prophet is trying to undo the preaching of Paul in this man's mind. He keep, keeps going to him and telling him, don't listen to Paul. Paul's a liar. And that doesn't really mean that. The Bible, God never said that. or All kinds of nonsense. And finally, Paul called him out on it. And he said, you child of the devil. And he walked in blindness after that. Because Paul cursed him. We got a few minutes. Let's talk about chariots of fire. Da, 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 da. Chariots of fire, what are they? 2 Kings 2, turn there. What would a chariot of fire be like? I guess if your car caught on fire, you'd know, wouldn't you? 2 Kings chapter 2. There's a beautiful story here, and... Make some notes here to read the, the context of this. Um, but in this story, we have the prophet Elisha. And the people are surrounded by, let's see, what army was it? Uh, let's see here. Oh, I'm in, I'm in a... I'm in a different story. Hang on. Second Kings chapter two is, is when Elijah was taken up into heaven. There's another story that I have in my notes. But anyway, second Kings chapter two, verse 11 is when Elijah was taken up to heaven. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. What were they? Was it the chariot caught on fire and the horses caught on fire or what? And parted them both asunder. What were what was this chariot of fire and these horses of fire? What were they? Psalm 104 tells you, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. So let me see if I can explain this. We're made of what primarily? Carbon. They call us carbon-based life forms because if our body burns up, what's left? Carbon. Ashes. Ashes. Wood ashes. Human ashes. They're carbon. That's what they are. So we're made up literally of dirt. That's what the Bible says. God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. But basically, we're made of dirt. And when they bury us in the ground, what do we turn back into? Dirt. This Bible's right, okay? But what are angels, spirits, what are they made of? They're made of a form of fire. Now, think of fire as light, maybe heat, but think of them that way because that's their substance. That's what they're made of. They're made of fire, the good ones and the bad ones. Because he sends this chariot of fire. And we know from Ezekiel 1, I've studied the daylights out of Ezekiel 1. And I'm still finding things in there. But Ezekiel 1, we have a description of the chariot of God. And it's literally made of angels. The wheels are alive on this thing. The wheels have a spirit in them. The spirit of the living creature was in the wheels of the chariot. So everything about this chariot was alive. It was a, it was an, it was a chariot made out of angels. And I know that's weird, but that's the spiritual realm around us. That's what makes it supernatural is that it's above the natural world that we're used to seeing. But learn what the Bible's telling you and learn to believe in it. Because I think it's important. I think Elijah's story is a picture of us when we go to heaven in the rapture. Somebody say amen. It's going to happen to us one of these days. And are we going to get to see chariots of fire? 
2 Kings 6. This is the story I had in my mind. And remember, all of these stories in the Bible are not only historical events, they're pictures of the future, what's going to happen. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 6, let me get the context here. I've got verse 15 up on the screen. But um, let's see, who was it that attacked? Verse 8, the king of Syria warred against Israel. And so the king of Syria sent a whole army of chariots and horses to go and kill all the Israelites, kill all the Jews, like Hitler. And Elisha has a servant, and he sees all this army of chariots and horses and men come racing across the desert to him, and he freaks out. We're all going to die! And so, what happens? Verse 15, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. They were surrounded by chariots and horses. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? We're going to die. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. What was, what was he surrounded by? Angels. An army of angels. And let's say... Let's say that there were 333,000 of the Syria army surrounding Israel. Guess how many angels would be there? 666,666. Where did I get that number from? Revelation 12. Because... Satan takes a third of the angels and casts them down the earth. And now what's left in heaven? Two thirds. Two thirds in my math book was more than one third. Because when we get downstairs and I see two thirds of a pie left over, it's mine. You get one third. I get two thirds, right? And then look what he said. There be more with us than there are with them. Because two-thirds is more than a third. This Bible, when you start connecting everything together, you'll go, whoa! That's what's going to happen. Listen, I believe this stuff is real, and I believe this stuff is going to happen before our eyes. Wouldn't it be, yeah, amen out there! Wouldn't it be something to get up one morning... And see all these devils surrounded every city around the world. And then all of a sudden, you see chariots of fire and horses of fire coming down out of the sky. Because how is, how is God going to gather together his saints? What did he say in Matthew 24? He will send his angels to gather his saints from the four corners of the earth. And I hope that every one of those angels looks like chariots of fire and horses of fire. Because I can't wait to get in mine. Let's go! Yeehaw! And I've never ridden a horse. But I'm going to get on that one. This stuff is real. Uh, the chariots of God. Let me show you that. This stuff is real. What are those lights in the sky? Are they military drones? No. What are they? Do, do angels appear to people on earth? And how do we know that? The Bible tells us, right? 
Angels appeared to Abraham. Angels appeared to Lot. Paul said, be careful to entertain strangers, for thou would be entertaining angels unaware. That's why when I talked to this guy last night, I was very polite to him. I didn't yell at him. I didn't say to him, get out of my church. Don't you ever come back. I did not do that to him. Something in me said, be nice to him. Invite him to breakfast. That guy could have been an angel. He could have been. Because he didn't do us any harm, did he? He didn't hurt us. What did he come in and say? Could have been. So do you think then it's possible that bad angels can be seen? That's what these are. They are, they are what we can see of evil angels. I don't believe Martians are waiting on Mars with their spaceships to come and invade Earth. But I do believe that angels are going to get kicked out of heaven and come down here. And the world will be waiting for them because they're going to see them as the savior gods of this planet. That's what's going to happen. That's supernatural, isn't it? And these things, the characteristics, I wasn't really going to spend much time talking about UFOs today, but the characteristics of UFOs, they do things that defy the laws of physics on this earth and they're real and we're now living in a time where every day you're seeing more and more stories about UFOs aren't you more and more stories are being released about UFOs and how the government is investigating UFOs and how the government is looking into the UFO issue and how how government agencies have what they call meta materials. They have pieces of things that they know it was impossible to have been made on this earth. They have them. They have them. And slowly but surely, more and more information is going to come out in the future. And it's going to blow your mind if you're not grounded in the Word of God. Okay? All right, are you hungry? Now, I don't know if they're ready downstairs, but it's 12 o'clock. They should be. So, let's go to the Lord in prayer. What are we going to talk about next? Oof, fiery serpents. And feathered, ser flying serpents. Flying snakes. That's what we're going to talk about. I told you it's going to be weird. <laughs>